people, that's Sister Josephine. I want you to give us those five bullet points we talked about in terms of the black agenda. Justine. But she is probably historical Joseph Freeman. Wait, Justine, 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 Justine. The root word of my name, of my grandmother's name, Justina Lillian. Justina. Go ahead. Justice. Lillian. Well, I felt that. I felt Lillian that. Lillian Winfrey of Miss Lillian Winfrey. Yeah. So you have that that Puerto Rican awesome grandmother I from feel Puerto Rico that's right. of African descent. Yeah, we accept. Don't look Jeez. any different. Jeez. And then we have what I know is, and I'm keying in on the retweets, Constantine Winfrey is my great, 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 great grandfather. Elmore Winfrey, Sanford Winfrey. Constantine had Sanford. Elmore Winfrey built Kosciuszko, Mississippi when there weren't power tools. And this is my great grandfather. Okay? The disconnect that I've seen with the migration to the north was the competition for stuff, for wealth, for things that weren't important anymore. The black man wasn't going to church with his family anymore because he was working three jobs to compete with the Joneses. This started with our grandparents. My grandfather, Albertus Winfrey, worked three jobs and he died from multiple melioma while working for making train engines. This was a good, great job to build his family from, from General Motors. By the time they got out there to view the site and see everything, all the asbestos had been gone. But the point is, you take a black man out of the household who once went to church with his family, who built who built schools, who built churches, who was a part of the civil rights movement. Why? Because it was spiritual. Let me let me objectify this conversation by allowing this young lady, as a 30, 30 and older person, to read an excerpt from this book that is highlighted so that you hear her migration story in the scenario that, that, that this, not what's highlighted from here to this page and it stops there. And this is the first person who watches the next generation. The debate over Negro clearance, the fear of Negro clearance, although the rumors of black displacement from the Mid-South Side had circulated since the Great Migration, Horace Caton, sociologist and director of the Parkway Community Center, articulated this community's fear in his writings in the late Depression years. Between 1937 and 1940, in important articles that appeared in the journals, Opportunity and Social Action, Caden analyzed black housing conditions and advocated policies that informed the housing debate between black elite factions in the post-war period. Caden warned that the recent demolition of buildings initiated by downtown business interests presaged the eventual displacement of blacks from the desirable location of the Mid-South Side. Caton reported that the real estate interests wanted to remove all blacks, quote, from the lakefront and west of South Parkway, quote, and replace them with middle class residential developments that would house whites who worked in the loop. The sa these same real estate interests also wanted, quote, desirable areas, end quote, such as Hyde Park and West Woodlawn, where affluent blacks live and hope to live, to be reserved for whites. Caden concluded that both the motivation and impact of land clearance were racial, both affluent and poor blacks would be displaced. In the post-war period, Sidney Williams, executive secretary of the Chicago Urban League, was able to see more clearly than Clayton, than Caton, the decentralizing trends that prompted pro-growth elites to create redevelopment schemes. He argued that downtown elites plan to clear and redevelop blighted areas to resettle middle class whites who could either walk or take public transportation to downtown. Though Williams characterized the motivation as quote, cold hard economic considerations, end quote, he too concluded that blacks would be pushed to the urban periphery. Quote, unless we do something to consolidate our position near the heart of American cities, end quote. Like Caden Williams did not single out wage-earning, non-property-owning blacks as being particularly vulnerable 
to this threat, all blacks were in danger. His advice to, quote, consolidate our position, end quote, recognized the desirable location of the South Side ghetto, but it also conveyed a determination to defend the institutions and property that black Chicagoans had accrued over the years. Williams used the military metaphor characterizing collective black actions in the previous 30 years as a form of urban trench warfare against white real estate interests. Instead of following the lead of the National Black Policy Faction who supported slum clearance and urban development while seeking safeguards for blacks displacement, a course of action that might have been expected for an urban league executive, Williams articulated the thinking of black opponents two slum clearance that emerged during this period. Williams saw downtown elites as seeking to replace the central city neighborhoods and their residents with white newcomers instead of sharing the new redeveloped housing with blacks. In fact, the Chicago Planning Commission in 1942 proposed that the redeveloped housing be for affluent blacks. In the view of Williams and other black elites, the plan would most likely result in all, in all blacks losing. This keys right in on what my grandmother said. When they came from the south side of Chicago, the poor blacks, truth be told, to my understanding, lived on the west side of Chicago. When they bought that, that property in the Austin area, there were still Polish people living over there. And my understanding, Madison Street looked like Michigan Avenue prior to the Chicago riots. Anytime you have a corridor where our people sell drugs and risk their lives and shoot and kill each other to go spend money on Madison and Pulaski, where you have people who have tapped into our business infrastructure, our economic development piece, where they get these, these incentives to have their businesses there but to sell us counterfeit goods. I hate We're talking I hate about from NAFTA. What's the cartoon say? <laughs> Black consumer, white business, Asian business, and others. Black business is a little small pig while everybody else gets fat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just, Why are we not this, this, is about, this is some elders in our community He's talking about this issue right now. So I, this is not nothing new, you guys. This no. is this has been going on a long time. And the, I, I'm going on a tour. The Akami family asked me to do a tour in Woodlawn. And Paul Bruce, who is now in his 90s, took us through Woodlawn and took us through the area that the University of Chicago first worked with the Blackstone Rangers and the Gangster Disciples to destabilize that community, tore it up, and showed me the 1940s black middle class that had moved into those communities. And he was pointing out how this was Dr. So-and-so's house. So we had made it into the middle class as early as 1940 when they lifted the restricted covenants and they went in and destabilized Woodlawn. You'll see with the cooperation of the Woodlawn organization, Lee got fed in the rest of them, them passes over there, yeah. sold out the community yeah, through the right. gang piece, mm -hmm. and that piece has now been institutionalized throughout the city of Chicago. Hey, yeah. mm -hmm. Back in the 1900s, let's say 20s before the uh, Chicago fire, wasn't something like a Black Wall Street and then the Black Wall Street, was, uh, the Black Wall Wall street ran down State Street uh -huh. from 18th Street. That's why in the Black Wall Street concept, we still call for the Black Wall Street to be on State Street from 18th Street all the way through the 67th Street. But wasn't at that time.